Welcome back. Let's talk about variance. What's all the chatter about variance? What is a variant? And why do variants matter? So many terms and so few definitions. At this point, I'm sure that you've probably heard the words isolate, variant, mutation or mutant, wild type, and even strain. It's been my observation that a lot of folks, particularly in the media, tend to use these terms interchangeably. You've probably also noticed a lack of reputable scientific outlets that will take the time to set the record straight and define these terms. Just for fun, I looked up these terms in several textbooks to try and shed some light. In fact, some of those textbooks were very specific to virology, and guess what? I could not find those definitions. Here's the problem. According to a very famous virologist by the name of Dr. Yins Kuhn, who works, in fact, with an international group that is charged with naming viruses, states that there really aren't any universally accepted definitions for many of these terms. So while I will attempt to explain these terms as they are conventionally used by the scientific community, Please keep in mind that there is indeed a lack of clarity on this topic. Now, to that point, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Vincent Racaniello, who's a professor at Columbia University and a virologist of 40 some odd years, who took the time to attempt to define these terms on social media. And we'll get to those terms in a moment. But first, we need to talk about the genome of SARS-CoV-2. Like I've said before, this is a seminar course and not a genetics course, so don't worry. We're going to keep things pretty basic. To begin, you should know that it is possible for anyone to look up the genetic sequence of SARS-CoV-2 through a simple internet search. The entire virus, meaning all of its structural and functional components, is just under 30,000 base pairs in length. Now, in case you want to impress your friends at a party, you could also say 30 kilobases. Now, here's what a portion of the sequence looks like. These letters represent the nitrogenous bases that we discussed in our Central Dogma video. The A that you see here stands for adenine. T stands for thymine. G stands for guanine. And C, cytosine. Now, for the eagle-eyed among you who have had a few biology courses, or maybe even a genetics course, you might be wondering, well, why would an RNA virus have thymine listed in its sequence and not uracil? Those of you that have no idea what I'm talking about when I say that, don't worry. It's not important for this particular seminar. But for those of you that, that did catch that, good on you. Good catch. The, the short answer is that all sequences are published as cDNA or complementary DNA, and that's for convention. If you want to learn more about cDNA and what it is, please feel free to reach out to me. But with that aside, the take-home point here is that the published sequence lists nearly 30,000 bases that represents the entire genetic blueprint of SARS-CoV-2. So hopefully you remember our discussion in the Central Dogma video about the makeup of proteins. Here's a reminder. In a DNA organism, DNA is transcribed by RNA polymerase into messenger RNA, or mRNA. That mRNA is translated into the cytoplasm of, of a host cell into a string of amino acids. Every three bases in mRNA, or what we would call a triplet, codes for a specific amino acid. That string of specific amino acids are strung in a specific order to become a protein precursor that's actually called a polypeptide. Now, the type of amino acids and the order of those amino acids influences how that polypeptide will be folded into a functional protein. Now, because SARS-CoV-2 doesn't have DNA, the first step isn't necessary. Like we said above, SSRNA basically serves 
as messenger RNA that's ready to be translated into a protein. So each of the four structural proteins and, a hand, and the handful of enzymes that make up SARS-CoV-2 are manufactured in the cell cytoplasm of the human host. Now, that brings us to our glossary terms from the beginning of this video. The word mutation describes a random event that changes one or more of those bases in that genetic code. Now, mutation results from constant replication. Just like anything, if you do something enough times, eventually mistakes are going to happen. Now, sometimes those mistakes or mutations don't actually have any impact at all. Nevertheless, for SARS-CoV-2, we're still tracking those mutations because we don't know whether they will have an impact or not. When enough mutations occur that we start to see a repeat of the same mutation, that's referred to as a variant. And in fact, a single mutation could be referred to as a variant, but, but what we're doing is we're seeing patterns starting to emerge, and when we see a repeat of those same mutations, that's when it's usually labeled as a variant. Now, variants are determined from viruses that are isolated from patients and then grown in culture. Now, those are referred to as isolates. So there's another glossary term down. Now, to be clear, for an isolate to be identified as a variant, we have to have a reference virus from which variants can differ, right? To put it another way, we have to compare isolates to know that something is different. That reference, um, reference sequence is generally referred to as the wild type sequence or the wild type virus. For example, the SARS-CoV-2 wild type is considered to be the Wuhan HU1 strain. So can a wild type SARS-CoV-2 virus be considered an isolate? Good question. Yes, it can, as long as it was isolated from a patient and exists in a tube somewhere, and therefore it'll be considered as an isolate. So that brings us to another glossary term that you may have just heard me use, strain. So what is a strain? Non-scientists love to bat this term around, and although they do, there must be a consensus or agreement among a group of ex experts to call something a strain. So these international experts that make that decision based upon a unique variant having stable properties uh, are the ones that actually identify something as a strain. So in other words, if a unique variant remains stable in terms of a genetic sequence and its properties, a group of experts, including Dr. Jens Kuhn, uh, he and his colleagues may consider elevating that variant to a strain. Okay? So, now that we've defined a few terms that have been kind of floating out there for a while, we can move into our discussion of some of the specific variants. To begin, you should be aware of the variant classification scheme that was developed by the SIG, or the SARS-CoV-2 Interagency Group that we've talked about before. These, uh, these folks have defined um, three classes of variants as part of this variant classification scheme. The lowest classification is variant of interest. Now, for accuracy, I'm going to uh, quote this definition directly from the CDC. Variants of interest are, quote, a variant with specific genetic markers that have been associated with changes to receptor binding, reduced neutralization by antibodies generated against previous infection or vaccination, reduced efficacy of treatments, potential diagnostic impact, or predicted increase in transmissibility or disease severity, end quote. Okay, so the following variants of interest that carry this new WHO variant label that we discussed in our urine review video, remember that? Um, the variants of interest uh, at the time of this recording, which is uh, mid-July, uh, are 
Epsilon, Eta, Iota, Kappa, and Zeta. So there's one, two, three, four, five variants of interest right now. Now, the next variant classification is variant of concern. And again, for, for clarity and precision, I'm going to use the CDC's definition of a VOC. A variant of concern is a variant for which there is evidence of an increase in transmissibility, more severe disease, for example, increased hospitalizations or deaths, significant reduction in neutralization by antibodies generated during previous infection or vaccination, reduced effectiveness of treatments or vaccines, or diagnostic detection failures. There are four current variants of concern as of July 2021. These are Alpha, Beta, Delta, and Gamma. Now, the highest classification level for SARS-CoV-2 is variant of high consequence. High consequent variants include all of the characteristics of a variant of concern with the additional caveat that there is, and I quote from CDC, clear evidence that pre I'm sorry, clear evidence that prevention measures or medical countermeasures have significantly reduced effectiveness relative to previously circulating variants. End quote. Now, fortunately, there are no current um, variants of high consequence. If you would like more information on these variants and what the difference in them is, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into that now um, because, again, it's a seminar course. Uh, if you want more information about that, you can reach out to me or you can check out www.cdc.gov for more information. Um, so there's one question that we didn't answer in this video from our list of questions at the beginning. I asked, why do variants matter? Now, to answer that question, you're going to need to join me in our next video on vaccines. I'll see you there.